Who mourns one woman in a holocaust? Surely her death has no significance. Yet in my heart she never will be lost. She who gave up her life to steal one glance. Akhmatova and St. Petersburg, the poet and the city, forever one. Anna Akhmatova loved St. Petersburg. Though born on the Black Sea in the south of Russia, she grew up in this imperial city, the city of Peter the Great, a city of great art galleries, theaters, churches and cathedrals, palaces and monuments, and made it her own. Akhmatova has been called the greatest female poet in the history of Western culture. Her poetry, frank, clear, intimate, is about love, religion, death, suffering, and survival the survival of the human spirit in the face of war, famine, and political terror. Irina Punina, daughter of Nikolai Punin, Anna's third husband, here remembers her times with Anna. Громкости всех станций mm -hmm. одновременно они кричали, это был какой-то совершенно кошмар. И тут она садилась и писала стихи. При таком полном она шуме, писала, она... ну, э, рождались она... они у нее. Я не, не понимала стихи, но Anna я понимала красоту, Irina Punina's звука, daughter. мелодию. She was almost like я как звонила, но, конечно, понимать я не понимала. И у нас даже была такая игра, я говорила, Акума, заземляй, mm -hmm. я не понимаю. Mm -hmm. И она это перенесла на многих своих читателей которые или слушатели, которые тоже не всегда говорили, что они могут понять, о чем идет, ведь она зашифрованная поэма в частности, и э, иногда она действительно заземляла, а иногда очень сердилась, что вот это не понимаешь, значит и не надо, чтобы ты понимала, оставлю так для того, чтобы здесь была тайна. Born in a Russia still ruled by the Tsars, Akhmatova lived through the Bolshevik Revolution and miraculously survived the Stalinist terror, a terror that Nobel laureate Joseph Brodsky called the most monstrous epoch in human history. Millions were rounded up and put into death camps, among them the great poet Mandelstam, a friend of Anna's. In 1910, Akhmatova married the poet and adventurer Nikolai Gumilyev, founder of Acmeism, the literary movement which emphasized clarity and directness in reaction to the then current vagaries of symbolism. Akhmatova's first book, Evening, published in 1912, was hugely popular and the beautiful young poet became a cult figure often reading at The Stray Dog, a cabaret held in a St. Petersburg cellar. But while Akhmatova enjoyed literary success, her married life was falling apart. Both Anna and Gumilyev were involved in extramarital affairs. This, plus his jealousy of his wife's success, resulted in divorce. Although this did not stop the two poets remaining close friends. In 1921, Gumilyev was arrested and falsely accused of taking part in a plot to overthrow the government. His execution devastated Akhmatova. Why is our century 
worse than any other? Is it that in the stupor of fear and grief it has plunged its fingers in the blackest ulcer, yet cannot bring relief? Westward the sun is dropping, and the roofs of towns are shining in its light. Already death is chalking doors with crosses and calling the ravens, and the ravens are in flight. Many of Akhmatova's friends and fellow writers were arrested or executed, and in 1933 her son, Lev Gumilyev, was arrested, and again in 1935 and 1949. For relation to the son, Akhmatova Но она писала «Ты сын и ужас мой», потому что судьба Льва Гумилёва, у которого был расстрелянный отец и мать, которая ну, только, так сказать, волею суде пока не оказалась в том же, во всяком случае, не была посажена, поэтому, конечно, она делала, вот когда Гумилёва арестовывали трижды, Льва Гумилева арестовывали трижды. Ну, э, когда маленький, ну, я могу сказать, когда маленький, он жил в Бежецке у бабушки, в, у матери Николая Степановича Гумилева. Э, лев жил у бабушки. А потом, когда он, так сказать, вырос, вот он учился в университете, в тридцать пятом году его первый раз посадили. Ахматова кинулась писать Сталину, чтобы его освободили и Пунина одновременно тоже арестовали. Вот. И его таки освободили. В 1935 году его не посадили. А второй раз его арестовали в 1938 году. И тоже она писала. И тоже она изо всех сил старалась его вызволить. И из этого ничего не получалось. Это была совершенно глухая стенка. Вот, так сказать, одна из, ну, в общем. To win her son's release, Akhmatova even wrote a few poems in praise of Stalin, poems that must have been poison to write. Later, Akhmatova declared that she never wished to see these poems included in any collections of her poetry. Despite persecution and state censorship, Stalin's cultural minister branded Anna as half nun, half whore, expelling her from the writers' union, banning her poetry and taking away her ration card, her only means of obtaining food. Despite this, and being constantly spied on, constantly under threat of deportation, Akhmatova never escaped to the West, as so many did. Instead, she stayed on in her beloved city of St. Petersburg, surviving the Nazi invasion and the Stalinist terror, surviving famine and freezing weather, her poetry giving a voice to the terrible suffering of the Russian people. We know what trembles in the scales, what has to be accomplished, the hour for courage. If all else fails, with courage we are not unfurnished. What though the dead be crowded, each to each? What though our houses be destroyed? We will preserve you, Russian speech. Keep you alive, great Russian word. We will pass you to our sons and heirs, free and clean, and they in turn to theirs, and so forever. Stalin banned the publication of Akhmatova's poems and for many years after writing a poem, she would commit it to memory and then burn the poem to avoid interrogation by Stalin's secret police. И до сорокового практически не печаталось. И все, что э, расходилось, э, это расходилось 
или в устной передаче, или э, ну, редко записываемый. Потому что сама Ахматова свои стихи хранила в памяти своей и своих друзей. Или жгла их. Отдатовник Пушкина, да. на котором была масса ее пометок и какие-то даже ее строчки. Написали. Потому что каждая вещь, если бы она попала в большой дом, она могла Можно быть уликой против всех кругом. И как бы вот это ощущение, очищение дома. Requiem is perhaps her greatest poem. A requiem is a religious service for the dead, a way of remembering the dead and helping their souls to rest in peace. Akhmatova's great poem is both about her son's imprisonment and her attempts to see him, and about the suffering of millions of ordinary Russian people under the terror of Stalin's dictatorship. There I learned how faces fall apart, how fear looks out from under the eyelids, how deep are the hieroglyphics cut by suffering on people's cheeks. There I learned how silver can inherit the black, the ash blonde overnight, the smiles that faded from the poor in spirit, terror's dry coughing sound. And I pray, not only for myself, but also for all those who stood there, in bitter cold, or in the July heat, under that red blind prison wall. Perhaps thinking of this poem, Brodsky called Akhmatova the muse of keening, a poet who could turn suffering into great poetry. I, like a river, have been turned aside by this harsh age. I am a substitute. My life has flowed into another channel, and I do not recognize my shores. Oh, how many fine sights I have missed. How many curtains have risen without me and fallen too. How many of my friends I have not met even once in my life. How many city skylines could have drawn tears from my eyes? I, who know only the one city, and by touch, in my sleep, I could find it. And how many poems I have not written, whose secret chorus swirls around my head, and possibly one day will stifle me. I know the beginnings and the ends of things, and life after the end and something it isn't necessary to remember now. And another woman has usurped the place that ought to have been mine and bears my rightful name, leaving me a nickname with which I've done, I like to think, all that was possible. But I, alas, won't lie in my own grave. The survival of this and all of Akhmata's poems is a testament to the resilience of the human spirit. The Stalin estate has long ago crumbled away. The Soviet Union has fallen to pieces. But Anna Akhmatova's poems survive and will be read for centuries to come. In 1953, Joseph Stalin died. Nikita Khrushchev became leader, denouncing Stalin as a tyrant. That same year, Akhmatova's son was released from prison, and in 1958, Akhmatova's poetry was again published, although with heavy censorship. Young poets flocked to her, and her fame spread. She travelled to England to receive an honorary doctorate from the University of Oxford. Ну, Анна Андреевна при мне публично не выступала. Да, вот я ее видела она публично. Да, да. да, сейчас я хочу сказать, в Англии, когда мы были, она выступала. 
И когда вечер Данте был, mm -hmm. когда она читала свое стихотворение посвященное, и я не могу сказать, как воспринимали, потому что Анна Андреевна была тогда символом свободы, символом мужества. Это наше было ощущение гордости, когда кто-то мог ее услышать. Но ты сам можешь mm -hmm. все хорошо представить. И зал рукоплескал ей. И это было ее последнее выступление 19 октября 1965 года. Я была с ней вместе в Большом театре на вечере, посвященном Данте. Год юбилейный Данте был. И ей, она была уже в очень тяжелом состоянии физическом. Ей было очень тяжело выступать. И преодолев... Ну, она умела собраться, она умела вот проявить какую-то не, необходимость. Это нельзя назвать мужеством, а какую-то собранность предельную ощущение вот такого нужности этого момента. И она держалась как королева. Она была красива, статна. Читала она замечательно, спокойно, ровно. Голос у нее был свободный. Акматова died in 1966. Peacefully and ironically on the 12th anniversary of Stalin's death. If you look at a map charting the planet Venus, you will come across the name Anna Akhmatova, a fitting monument for this great poet of love and survival. So many requests always from a lover, none when they fall out of love. I'm glad the water does not move under the colourless ice of the river. And I'll stand, God help me, on this ice, however light and brittle it is. And you, take care of our letters, that our descendants not misjudge us, that they may read and understand more clearly what you are, wise, brave, In your glorious biography, no row of dots should stand. Earth's drink is much too sweet, love's nets too close together. May my name be in the textbooks of children playing in the street. When they've read my grievous story, May they smile behind their desk lids. If I can't have love, if I can't find peace, give me a bitter glory. <laughs> 